this is a nice little segue into our next presenter, uh, which is Magna Terra, who bought um, a few exploration assets off of Anaconda last year um, and has been progressing those projects. And I believe that we have Lou Lorick joining us, um, just talking about Newfoundland. I believe it's ranked 11th most attractive place uh, by the Fraser Institute. Um, you know, one of the things that we like about it is that it's a safe jurisdiction and it's significantly underexplored. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Hi, Liv. Hi, Deb. Happy, to, happy to follow our colleagues at Anaconda. Uh, very, very excited about what they've got going on, obviously. And as, uh, as the uh, founder of Anaconda, I've been involved since 2007 and uh, remain involved. So um, it's, been, it's been a busy and exciting week. Uh, yeah, congrats on the, the drop samples you put out today. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to hearing that. Hi, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Sorry about Hi, uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, good to see everyone. Well, I'll turn the mic over to you guys. Why don't you tell us what you've been up to in Newfoundland? All right, Dave, you want to share the screen there? And well, thank you. Thank you to Adelaide Capital for uh, for hosting this. I think it's very, very timely. Uh, obviously, um, you know, I've, I've been in this region, been involved since 2007, as I said, as the founder of Anaconda. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a rewarding to me to see the interest that the market's now starting to take uh, in the region. Um, uh, certainly, uh, Stephen Dean's uh, Atlantic Gold was uh, was really a, you know a, a, a watershed moment uh, for the whole region in terms of highlighting the potential for uh, for large gold uh, you know projects. And uh, we're gonna you know we're gonna try and demonstrate that uh, there's more to be found. Um, you know, pretty bold statement. Atlantic Canada's next gold exploration success story, but. Uh, you know, that's what we're planning uh, is uh, finding, you know, the next large mineable gold deposit in uh, Atlantic Canada. So with that, we'll move into the presentation. Uh, we're making some forward looking statements. So we, uh, we, you know, put this in there, but uh, next slide, we will uh, talk a little bit about our team. And I think it's useful. It's been very, actually very useful to follow, follow our colleagues at Anaconda, because as you mentioned, Deb, off the top, the uh, projects that we have acquired in Atlanta, Canada, we did acquire them this past August from uh, from Anaconda, and we also have an agreement, uh, management services agreement, where we are leveraging the uh, the Anaconda, both the Anaconda technical team and and finance team, uh, which is useful for both companies in the sense that we we uh, you know we've got significant history here, uh, boots on the ground, um, and so it's a great cost sharing initiative for both companies. My background a little bit, I've uh, kind of been a serial, uh, serially involved in a number of companies, both uh, as a founder, uh, president, CEO, director, uh, very, very involved in a number of companies, been involved with a number of success, successful exits as well. Uh, obviously, we're looking to do something similar with, uh, with Magna Terra. Um, I've mentioned we're very technically deep uh, with regards to our, our uh our team, uh, as an exploration company, I think you know our focus is, uh, you know, putting 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 our uh, capital into the ground and and uh, leveraging the technical technical expertise that we do have. Um, you just heard from Paul McNeil uh, on the Anaconda presentation. Uh, Paul is a, a technical advisor to the company, as is Dave Copeland, who are both Anaconda employees. Dave is basically seconded to to uh, Magna Terra on, you know, I wouldn't say a full-time basis, but right now pretty close to a full-time basis. And our board is again, uh, you know, made up of uh, deep technical roots. Um, so that's where our, you know, really our expertise is. So a little quick uh, slide here about our share structure. We uh, have, have uh, completed a consolidation uh, in association of the acquisition of the the uh, Atlantic Canada portfolio from Anaconda this past summer. Uh, very, very tight share structure, uh, just shy of 50 million outstanding. Anaconda is a significant shareholder. The management as well. Uh, I personally own about 15% of the company. Um, and then we have some strategic uh, and institutional inv investors that came into the financing. So our float is really, you know, I think realistically 20 to 25%. 
Uh, so we are very highly leveraged, you know, to any any good news, any success we 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 will have with the drill bit. Um, the current market cap is nine million dollars, which is cheap by any measure, and we'll we'll discuss that a little later. Uh, next slide, Dave. Thank you. So this is a this gives you a little bit of an idea of where our projects are located. Uh, we are located in the provinces of Newfoundland and Labrador and uh, in New Brunswick. In in Newfoundland, we have uh, uh, a project uh, called Great Northern. Uh, in I guess it's Western Newfoundland uh, proper. Uh, and in in uh, New Brunswick, we are in Southern New Brunswick with two projects, Cape Spencer and, and uh, the Hawk and Club project. All three projects represent what I would what I would consider camp or district scale opportunities. Um, and they're they're substantiated or backstopped with existing 43101 in ground resources for just over 400,000 uh, uh, globally inferred global global inferred ounces between the Cape Spencer project and the Great Northern project. Um, our strategy is to you know have boots on the ground and and expand not only expand on these resources that we already have but make make additional discoveries. And as I mentioned, with regard to our team, we have significant experience in the region. And you know our goal is to develop or, or you know, effectively delineate a a, uh, a large gold deposit uh, at one or or all three of these projects over the next three to five years. We're currently pretty well funded. We've got uh, as of uh, the end of year about uh, 2.2 million bucks in working capital, um, and that's made up of a combination of uh, both flow through and hard dollars. Um, and so we're well funded to, to uh, facilitate our exploration programs, um, you know, through to through 2021, and uh, with a little bit of additional cash in there and form a flow through to to follow on any any success we may have. Next slide, Dave. Thanks. Um, why Atlantic Canada? I think uh, you know most of the uh, uh, the companies that have. have Come before me, and we'll come after. We'll 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 explain uh, this this slide as 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 easily as as uh, or as well as uh, we hope to. But it's for for the longest time, it's been a, a kind of an underexplored and misunderstood, uh, you know, part of the uh, of, uh, you know major gold belt structure here. Um, but that you know recently that has changed, and uh, as I'd mentioned. You know, Atlantic Gold's uh, uh, Moose River Complex it went a long way to really highlighting that. Ob obviously, Marathon's Valentine Lake at 4 million ounces has proven as well that, you know, major gold deposits uh, can be found here. Uh, but historically, Hope Brook as well, Hale in the, in the Carolinas, uh, Hale Ridgeway. And I have to mention, as, as of course, you could do a little shout out here to Anaconda with Goldboro. You know, Goldboro should be on that slide as well now being at you know, 2.7 million ounces, you know, M, M, M and I and I. Uh, so really there's lots of opportunity here to find world-class gold deposits. And it's very underexplored, uh, you know, when you compare it to the other major gold camps in Canada. You know, the right, the right rocks, the right age rocks, uh, large, you know, large gold bearing structures, you know, everything you need uh, geologically to, to find a, a large deposit. Add to that that it's it's uh, all three jurisdictions, uh, New, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, are friendly and 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 first tier mining uh, uh, jurisdictions. Um, you know, so it's it's a very very good place to work. Next, Dave. I'm going to turn it over to Dave, uh, who's going to give you a little deeper uh, geological dive on our. You know, effectively, our two flagship projects, and I'd like to say we have have two flagship projects: Great Northern in Newfoundland and, and Cape Spencer in New Brunswick. Um, you know, they're one and one A. Uh, they both have uh, they're both similar in terms of their their uh, like call it the geology, um, and uh, and uh, we think they hope they host uh, you know significant opportunity to to. Uh, Develop into uh, major gold, major gold camps. Dave, over to you. 
Great, thanks a bunch, Lou. Um, yeah, as Lou said, uh, you know, each of our projects are, are really, uh, you know, they're focused around existing resources, uh, but ours is an exploration story. Um, so starting with Great Northern, uh, we have we have really two large property blocks here that cover this uh, this twenty kilometer section of the Deucers Valley Fault. Uh, the Deucers Valley Fault is a is a known gold bearing uh, gold causative structure. Uh, with two deposits along it, the Thor deposit, which has a, a historic resource of 63,000 ounces in the indicated category at 2.09 grams and 20,000 ounces in the inferred category at 1.79. Uh, and to the north in the Great Northern Block, uh, Great Northern Project Block, we have the Rattling Brook deposit that has 255,000 ounces of inferred resources at 1.45 grams. Um, really, this is a you know this this geological environment and and our projects kind of carry this the similar theme where we're along these large crustal scale shear zones here at the Deucers Valley, uh, really that bound these older uh, you know Proterozoic intrusion here off to the to the west uh, of the main river Pluton with younger Silurian age rocks uh, volcanic and sedimentary rocks of the Sops Arm group here. Uh, the main focus for our work thus far has been on the Jackson's Arm trend, and this is where we see um, lots of potential for, for near-term discovery and, uh, and adding to that resource base. Ultimately, the, the environment here is similar to, to Marathon Gold's Valentine Lake project, uh, where we're really on a parallel structure that, that transects the island of Newfoundland, uh, but we're against these Proterozoic and uh, Silurian contacts. Um, as shown in the next slide. So here's Marathon's uh, Valentine Lake project uh, with multiple deposits along the Valentine Lake shear zone uh, here. And, and really that shear zone uh, is right at the boundary between the, the Valentine Lake uh, intrusive suite, which is a proterozoic granite and younger uh, Silurian rocks in through here. Uh, so very similar geologic environment uh, as the Great Northern project. So as I, as I said uh, prior, we're, we're focusing on this Jackson's Arm trend, which is, is just here to the north um, in this area. Uh, so zooming into that, really the, um, the, uh, the Jackson's Arm trend, uh, which is a 2.4 kilometer long zone of alteration and mineralization, is sitting along a, a faulted contact between the Ordovician Coney Head Complex and the Silurian Sops Arm Group here in green and yellow to the, to the south. Uh, this contact uh, is a thrust fault uh, where the Ordovician rocks, the, the granites of the Coney Head Complex are thrust over top of the younger Silurian rocks. And this is a fault splay off of the, the Deucers Valley Fault and it, it runs right through here. Uh, so currently alteration is, is highlighted in, in this, this orange color through here. Uh, most of the alteration is within the granite and uh, exploration work that we, we really did um, uh, in the fall of, of 2020, really focused on following this contact uh, between the granite and the SOPS arm group through this area and really trying to expand the potential uh, of this central corridor outward. Uh, and uh, we were essentially uh, quite successful in doing that. Um, so our 2020 exploration program uh, comprised uh, systematic geophysics on this, uh, this grid outlined in gray. Uh, so we did about 59 line, line kilometers of magnetic and 51 kilometers of IP surveying, uh, systematic prospecting and geological mapping across the grid, uh, and collected uh, just over 1,200, almost 1,300 soil samples over this area. So really the results of that work <clears throat> are shown here. The, the, the soil samples are bubble plotted uh, in the circles with really anything above uh, in the in the yellow or uh, orange and red colors being a significant anomaly, what we generated was a was a you know a two plus kilometer long uh, soil uh, anomaly over the contact outside of the core area that was previously known, and in particular we generated these these quite quite nice soil anomalies to the south uh, in this area down towards Frenchman's Cove. Uh, as part of our prospecting, we extended the alteration zone 700 meters to the to the south uh, east and had grab samples up to 29 26.9 grams per ton, really replicating uh, results of of some of the previous work, which are shown here below on on the left. 
Um, so again, you know, we have lots of lots of targets to follow up going forward. Uh, you can also see our IP chargeability uh, anomalies in this uh, red hatched mark that really follow this contact, multiple targets within the granite, and and again going around that that coney head Silurian sops arm contact to the east. As part of our exploration program, uh, we also did a, a phase one. Um, you know, 1600 meter program in nine holes. This was the first drilling to be completed at Jackson's Arm. Uh, and really we, we tested the core 300 meters uh, of this 2.4 kilometer long alteration zone. Uh, the drilling was successfully intersected broad alteration and mineralization in each of the holes that we tested. Uh, we drilled underneath these, these trenched occurrences um, and, uh, and had highlights uh, as follows. So 4.65 grams over 0 0.5 meters, 3.84 over 0 0.5 and two grams over a meter. This is the, the type of mineralization that we hit and very characteristic of what we see at surface at, uh, within that larger alteration zone. Uh, you can see we have, we have disseminated and cloddy pyrite associated with stockwork veins in this, this pink highly altered granite. Uh, as you can see here, there's also accessory calcopyrite uh, in with the veins. And this is where we're getting some of the better grades within the drilling that we've seen. Um, you know, so up, up to 4.67 grams over 0 0.5 meters. Um, you know, lots of, lots of broader, um, you know, disseminated gold throughout. Uh, and this is the type of mineralization that's giving us sort of those, those, um, those broader lower grades, this disseminated pyrite throughout the, throughout the host granite. So really, uh, you know, follow-up work uh, on Jackson's arm this year. We'll we'll probably go back uh, this summer and uh, and you know test uh, some of the strike extent of the Jackson's arm um, prospect as we go forward. We're we're currently undertaking additional um, soil sampling and uh, and some alteration studies on the drill core. Uh, switching over now to uh, to our projects in southern New Brunswick. So we have two key projects uh, in the region. Uh, our, our flagship one in New Brunswick is the Cape Spencer project, which we're currently focused on. It's uh, about 10 kilometers just outside of the city of St. John, uh, as shown here. And then also our, our grassroots Hawkins Love project, which we just picked up this past fall. So both projects sit along these major um, crustal scale uh, fault zones uh, that transect southern New Brunswick. Uh, which are also host to, uh, to Galway Gold's Clarence Stream deposit, as shown here in, in western, southwestern New Brunswick. The Hawkins Love Project is essentially the mirror image of Clarence Stream, and I'll, I'll provide a little more detail on that, but it really sits on the other side of the, the St. George Batholith here uh, at a similar sheared contact uh, and deformed contact as Clarence Stream. Uh, Cape Spencer is really bounded by this Millican Lake Fault, which is, which is quite key to... Uh, to localizing gold mineralization. Uh, so again, very similar, you know, even though it's in New Brunswick, very similar geological setting to, uh, to the Valentine Lake deposit. We essentially have a Proterozoic granite here in pink, the Millican Lake granite. And uh, it's, uh, it's sitting along, uh, bounded to younger sediments along this, this Millican Lake fault, which extends for about 15 kilometers as it's, as it's currently mapped and really transects the property from southwest to northeast. Uh, most of the geology here dips shallowly off to the, to the southeast. Uh, so a lot of this uh, is really you know, available for, for exploration drilling, very shallow, multiple uh, dipping thrust panels. Uh, most of the mineralization at, uh, at Cape Spencer is hosted at the contact between these brown sediments and the pink Millican Lake granite. Uh, and really follows those contacts. So that's why these following these contacts is very important for, for our work. Uh, resources at, uh, at the Cape Spencer project include uh, 54,000 ounces at 1.71 uh, grams per ton in the past producing Cape Spencer open pit, just to the Southwest on the property here. And then the nearby Northeast zone, which is, uh, can, contains 96,000 ounces at 4.07 grams per ton gold. Uh, so nice, uh, nice resource base here again on the project. Uh, we know we know the host uh, geological setting to that mineralization well. 
but really the focus for our for our exploration going forward is where we see the most potential here at the Emilio trend, um, you know, in the central part of the property. And this is where a lot of our focus is uh, currently on, on the project. Uh, zooming into the Emilio trend now, we, uh, we can see uh, some of the rock samples that we uh, re-released today. Uh, so we've had some pretty good early success uh, following up on historic results through this area. Again, very, very little drilling, just like at Jackson's Arm. So there's, there's only four holes drilled here at the Emilio zone, which have had some pretty good results uh, historically. So 7.86 grams per ton over 7.4 meters. Uh, lots of you know, visible gold bearing float and, and high grade float through this area that really just has not been drill tested uh, over this five kilometer stretch of the Emilio trend. So work that we've done uh, so far this year is, is really been, you know, finding additional float occurrences. Uh, we're currently in the middle of a, a soil and geophysical uh, program over mostly the, the eastern saw half of the Emilio trend. But we've, uh, we've sampled float up to 21.2 grams per ton gold. And a lot of the floats and, and soil anomalies tend to be uh, lining up along these north-northeast splays. So there's, there's essentially two main targets here to host gold mineralization, and that's the, the contacts between these brown Cape Spencer group sediments and the Millican Lake uh, granite where they're faulted, and these, these fault splays that are more north-northeast oriented that seem to more locally host mineralization, uh, including visible gold bearing uh, quartz veins. Uh, so again, a few, few highlights here from previous work, 7.86 grams per ton over 7.4 at Emilio, uh, you know, and then 7.75 over three in chip samples at the Goldbrook zone over here. So ample targets for, for follow-up um, um, uh, drill testing. Uh, just some some drill core from the Emilio zone. This is that uh, that historic hole here that uh, that intersected um, this uh, 7.86 over 7.4. So a nice near surface uh, mineralized zone. It essentially collared in at this hole. So uh, this this occurrence itself is open along strike. So our, our upcoming drill program, uh, which will comprise about two two thousand meters of of initial testing in this area, will will follow up on that. Uh, moving on to Hawkins Love here, I'll just I'll give you a brief overview of Hawkins Love. But again, regionally it sits on that uh, that contact here between the the pink St. George batholith and the the bounding mascarene sediments in in green. Uh, a similar similar geological environment, really the same geological environment, just a, a mirror image as the the Clarence Stream deposit. Uh, so here we can see the geology in detail. So we have the mascarene sandstones in, in, in brown and mafic volcanics in green. And, and really this, uh, this contact sits along the, uh, you know, an eight kilometer stretch of the Back Bay Fault, which runs through here. And uh, we have several anomalous uh, historic soil samples over uh, eight kilometer uh, strike length here. Uh, there's really only about um, like 10 or 15 drill holes that have sporadically tested this area, mostly for, for base metal mineralization. Uh, some of that early work has been, been fairly impressive. Um, you know, there's a 20 me two meter wide uh, alteration zone with quartz veins, pyrite, calcopyrite, and specular hematite and minor visible gold from one of the historic holes that really hasn't had any follow up. Um, and then there's quartz vein boulders up to 302 grams per ton uh, down in the southwest part of the property that really haven't had any follow-up exploration. So uh, this is a really, uh, really solid grassroots uh, project for, uh, for Magna Terra. Uh, it sits in a fairly active part of, uh, of, uh, of southern New Brunswick. And I think, um, you know, given the drilling that... Uh, that Galway has been doing over the last few years. I, I think this, uh, you know, they, they're probably in line to have a fairly strong resource update uh, coming forward. And, uh, and I think Hawkins Love uh, is well positioned to, uh, to benefit from that. Okay, well just, I know we're pressing time here. So uh, we'll just quickly recap. Um, you know, we've, we're, we're funded to, on the rest of our programs here. Uh, Cape Spencer Drilling is gonna start here in about 10, 10, 10 days to two weeks. Uh, as Dave mentioned, a 2,000 meter program to test some of those high priority targets. Uh, we're at, at Great Northern. Uh, we will be back in there, subject to the success we have at Cape Spencer. 
Um, but we, we've got a number of targets to, to, to test at uh, Great Northern with a, with a phase two program. Hawkins loved the uh, summer program of data compilation and, uh, and uh, historic review, rec reconnaissance prospecting and mapping, and, and some glacial till and soil sampling. Uh, so, you know, lots of, lots of catalysts coming up, uh, specifically uh, highlighting the Cape Spencer drill program. Uh, you know, we'll have news flow. Uh, we'll have a little little gap here for a couple of weeks, but we'll have news flow coming, uh, you know, well and deep into the spring. Um, so, so lots of lots of opportunity for for uh, uh, price appreciation. Uh, we're very leveraged to to discovery here. Uh, uh, discovery hole, I think, uh, would uh, would uh, you know uh, because of the tight stock flow would be would be very interesting for us. Uh, so, what are the key investment takeaways? You know, Magnetera uh, has a very high value ex exploration asset package in you know in great jurisdictions. Uh, we've got a great technical team. Uh, under the, the assets are underpinned by established resources that, you know, by any measure are highly undervalued to our peer comps. Uh, as mentioned, we've got, you know, significant leverage to new discovery and that, that is our focus is making new discoveries on these projects. Uh, um, you know, I pointed out the news flow. Um, you know, the team, uh, I say it over again, uh, you've seen what we've done at Anaconda. Uh, you know, uh, a large portion of that team, specifically the technical team, is active with Magnaterra. Uh, we've got a track record of, of discovery, growth, and and uh, and uh, exits. Uh, and you know, we uh, we run a tight ship. Um, we don't. We we focus on putting money in the ground. Um, uh, you know, we think we're going to find two to three five two to three million ounces in the next uh, three to five years. Uh, we think we've got the projects to do that, and uh, we really believe Atlantic Canada is is uh, is you know uh, highly uh, undervalued from the standpoint of uh, gold exploration and gold production. So, with that, I turn it back to you, Deb, and thank you both very much. Uh, and Dave, thanks for uh, uh, for participating with me. Uh, if there's any questions. Yeah, or time for questions, or we can answer the questions uh, uh, by email afterwards. Yeah, I think we're a little bit over time. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to send me an email and I'll get those answered for you. And thanks for walking us through the, the projects, uh, David and Lou. It's interesting, so much activity going on in Newfoundland. Yes, you know, across, across the Atlantic provinces. I mean, Newfoundland, uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, you know, Dave mentioned Galway. I mean, you know, I, I, they're due to put their uh, resource calc out sometime, you know, in the second half of the year, and, and I imagine it's been two and a half years of constant drilling. I think they're gonna they're gonna come out with a you know pretty substantive update. Uh, so you know, all three provinces uh, right now um, you know have the recipe for for significant gold discoveries. Yeah, 